Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Alrighty, folks, it is Shay here, and welcome back to another episode of Casual Cattle Conversations. Today, we are talking about the harvesting side of the beef cattle business, but it's a unique story. So we are visiting with Sierra Jepson, and she is the owner of Butcher Solutions, where she travels the country and helps train the workforce to become more skilled in how they're harvesting animals, how they are cutting up carcasses. And I think that is just a needed profession. It's awesome how she can impact so many people. And I'm just really excited to share her story. And maybe she's someone that you want to bring to your own hometown or connect with your own local shop. But before we dive into that, if you are ready to start your podcast and just dive right in and start creating content that impacts people, that serves as a top of funnel for your business, or is maybe even a hobby, but better yet, what if it could make you money? I want to direct you to my Kickstart Your Podcast workbook. So this workbook is for the do-it-yourself podcaster who is ready to just get started. The workbook helps you nail down your topic, craft the perfect name. We simplify the whole SEO process. It helps you own your interview style and you can crack the code on content planning. And all of this is in the form of templates, questions, and a few additional resources that, as a bonus, I'll happily send your way. So if you're interested in that, head to my website. That's in the show notes. And you just send me a message. Or you can buy directly off my website as well. With that, let's visit with Sierra. Well, Sierra, it is a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. And you have a unique business. And uh, those are always some of my favorite stories to share. So before we dive into your business, I'm curious a little bit more about your background in the beef industry. Did you grow up in it? Are you new to it? What did that look like before you started your business? Yes. So I grew up in the rural farming community of Amanda, Ohio, and um, our family raised corn, wheat, soybeans, beef cattle, the whole Midwestern gamut. Um, My sister, she still farms full time with my dad today. And uh, growing up, we both knew that we wanted to work and be involved very closely with the cattle community. And we would joke that my sister Cheyenne was the one who would be raising the cattle and I would be the one running the business. And we didn't really know. It's like, well, you know, how, how is that going to fit in? And so I was always looking to find like, where is, where is my role in the cattle community? If it's not raising the cattle every day. And so when I went to, went to school at Ohio state, I was an ag business major um, because my dad always said if he could go back and, you know, go to school again, he would have taken more business classes and he would have paid more attention. So I, I took, you know, more business classes. I don't know if I paid as much attention as we all should. And now I own my own business. So, (laughs) (laughs) Um, but I, I wasn't an animal science major. I was a minor because I knew I never wanted to be a vet. And so it's like, oh, you know, I'll get to take all the animal science classes I really wanted. And by my my first senior year, I wasn't able to get into the beef production class that I'd waited my whole college career to get into because I wasn't an animal science major. And so the class was full. I was distraught because I really wanted to take that beef production class. All of the internships I'd had in college had been in different Uh, different departments, you might say, or different areas of the cattle community. So I'd worked, you know, with certified Angus beef and on a cattle ranch in Montana. And I, I just knew it's like, man, I needed to take this class. So when it was full, I was so sad. And so I took a meat science class and said, and it was like, okay, beef, cattle, beef, it's the same thing, right? Not the same thing. Uh, But by day two, I had just fallen in love with meat science. And I knew that it was the perfect way to connect what the livestock producers were doing every single day with what the end consumer expected of 
those proteins. And so it was, it was the perfect way to, you know, still get to work with my hands and still really connect with the livestock producers and to make the most of that end product and still get to talk to consumers about why we need red meat proteins in our diet. And so um, I love that I got to buy knives instead of books. And I love the history of the meat industry. And I loved um, getting to work in the meat lab. And I joined the meat show judging team and I decided to take a fifth year in college to only do meat science and so from there it just really started to snowball that my place in the cattle community was actually in the world of butchers. So I want to talk about you know the gap between what you just shared and what you're doing today but we haven't talked about what you're doing today so talk about your business (laughs) first and then we'll go back and fill in the blanks. Yep. So my business is called Butcher Solutions LLC, and it is a traveling butcher school. So I, it's not a mobile slaughter unit. I don't own brick and mortar. I don't own a trailer. The whole premise behind the business is that we need more butcher education, but we need to meet our butchers where they are physically at, whether they are working in a old outdated facility that was built in like the fifties and the sixties, and they're trying to make the most of an an older facility and train and bring in new butchers. Or if these are livestock producers that took it upon themselves during the COVID era to, you know, try to solve the infrastructure problems where they didn't have, they didn't have the, uh, the, the slots to harvest their own livestock because all of our local producers or our meat shops were, were slammed. So these livestock producers, they built their own facilities and they got grant money, which is great. But now we need to, to train more butchers to take over that role so those livestock producers can go back to being livestock producers. So the Traveling Butcher School is here so that I can travel with my brain and my knives, and I can go into these facilities and we can help them find and retain skilled labor to make their facility work for them. Because there there are opportunities to to learn how to cut meat through YouTube videos or to read a book or Mm -hmm. um, to go to a university and take a workshop. But at the end of the day, when you actually go and start cutting meat and if whether you're a brand new butcher or somebody who has a change of career and just thinks it'd be fun to be a butcher or um, whatever it might be, it is hard to actually get started on a piece of meat and to know where do I make this break? What is this cut actually called? We as butchers, we named things a million different things and we have six different common names and a scientific name. And so what is a Delmonico steak? What is a flat iron steak? What is the tri-tip? Where do these come from? How do I find them? How do I make them look recognizable to a consumer in the meat case? Um, and even as the beef producers, where we maybe we even know what these cuts are, and what they look like, how do we find them? And how do we make them look the same as our cattle change and as carcass size is different or quality grade? How do I build a branded meats program? And so the Traveling Butcher School is here to really help livestock producers find ways to to sell and market their critters, their beef, pork, lamb. Um, I'm a beef person, so, and, and beef cattle, we have more cuts and they're all more complicated. So I find myself working with butchers who are needing more help with beef more than other proteins. But I'm here to, to be that traveling butcher school meat science educator um, to help people just make the most out of their livestock carcasses, um, specifically for at the butcher level. Well, I love all of that. (laughs) And there's so much we could talk about. Yes. (laughs) But let's go back and fill in the blank. So you went from, how did you get from falling in love with that meat science class, taking that super senior victory lap (laughs) so that you could have more meat science class to butcher solutions, LLC. Yeah. Like, so I, I knew I wanted to go to grad school because I, I just found meat science my, my first senior year. So it's like, okay, I'm going to take a fifth year to only do meat science. But I think, you know, I want more, I want more. We always want more. So I wanted more. And so I knew grad school was, was on the docket. And I, I kind of, I wanted that title of meat scientist. Cause that sounds really cool. So I'd like to do a, a master's specifically with something in meat science and being a beef person, I wanted it to be with beef. So I was planning to go to grad school immediately after my time at Ohio state. And the day, the day I was going to accept a grad school program. Uh, one of my professors has said, wait, 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 found a job for you. I was like, job, I'm going to go to grad school. Um, but when I read the description, like 
there was no doubt in my mind that was what I was meant to do. And it was to be the, the meats judging coach at the University of Wyoming and to manage their cowboy branded meats program. Um, and so I, I delayed grad school to take that job at the University of Wyoming. And I coached meat judging teams for four years from 2017 until 2021. Um, getting to manage their branded meats program took all of the trim that came in from their meat product products, um, anything that, you know, the, the carcasses that we're working on with the meats judging team, we then made those products into summer sausage and snack sticks. And then we could sell those on lot or, um, on campus and in the community. And so not only was I getting experience, getting college students excited about meat science and taking them into big packing plants and teaching them, um, you know, quality defects in the meat world and main primals and how do we, how do we grade beef cattle, both quality and yield grade. So I was teaching them the basic principles of meat science, but I was also managing a branded meats program myself. And so during this time, like managing these, these, uh, these meat judging teams um, out on mountain time, which I loved. That's when COVID hit. And so no longer was I able to take our meats judging teams to the large packing plants that we were normally practicing in. We were visiting smaller meat facilities just in, in town, around the community. And so I was able to chat with the guys and the gals that were running those local meat shops in a small town during COVID. And you know, every time I chat with them, I'm like, how, how are you doing? And they're like, we're doing great. Business has never been better. People have never been more excited and fired up about local meats. Like, and they really want, you know, to have a connection with their producer. They want local meats and our livestock producers need more slots to bring their cattle, their pigs, their sheep to be harvested. Cause again, the big guys don't have as much availability. The problem was they couldn't find and retain enough skilled labor to make their lives <laughs> make sense because they were just working themselves to the bone, trying to do their best to get livestock producers the, the harvest slots that they needed and get the meat products to the consumers who wanted it. And so my wheels started turning. I was like, okay, there is a need for more skilled retained labor in butchery. I am currently training college students. What if, what if after I'm done being, uh, you know, teaching college students meat judging, what if I go and I work at a butcher school and I train other people to be butchers and people who are looking for a change of career or folks that are hunters, but want to know more, like what are the actual cuts of wild game? And what if there's somebody who's in the military who wants to get out and go and work at a shop? And, you know, in Italy and Germany, like being a butcher is such a a prestigious job and these shops are really, really classy and they're turning out this, this product that customers want. Why does it have to have this stigma that in the United States being a butcher means cold, wet, concrete, grueling job? Like, can't, can't I get other people really excited about butchery? And so as I was thinking about what that next step might be, when I was done being a meats coach, I realized through my Google searches that a, a butcher school doesn't really exist. Now, I'm not going to say that Butcher Solutions is the only one of its kind, because that's just that's just naive. I'm surely there's something else out there. But if if I'm just a Joe Schmo or just a Sierra Jepson that wants to learn to be a better butcher, I could pay a couple thousand dollars to go and do an apprenticeship program, you know, in Canada or at a culinary program that's going to take several years. I could go to a workshop at a university, but that also it's, it's kind of pricey. And um, at the end of the day, like, am I going to learn hands on or am I just going to watch somebody break down a carcass? And so that's where my my wheels just started turning. It's like I could open my own traveling butcher school. Why am I going to go and work for a butcher school if I could open my own traveling butcher school? And so that's at that time, I realized it's like to do this, I need to be a better butcher myself. And so then that's what led me to grad school, where my my main goal I had in the back of my mind that I was going to open this butcher school. So I reconnected with a previous grad grad school mentor who was Dr. Phil Bass, and he had worked at Certified Angus Beef. I knew that he um, he understood beef cattle, the beef industry, and he understood what the livestock producers were trying to do. He also understood the academic side of meat science and wanted to marry those two and make both a very applicable, you know, make it applicable for those in the industry, but also make it academic, um, which is sometimes we have a disconnect between industry and academia. And so um, I knew it's like if I could learn how to be a better butcher from Dr. Bass, 
then I've got a real shot at starting this butcher school. And so I went to the University of Idaho for grad school. And that's that's where then the butcher solutions really got off the ground. Ranchchannel.com. I'll give you all just a few seconds to head there on your phone. Ranchchannel.com. Go ahead. Ranchchannel.com. Your farm and ranch network on demand. Bull sales, western events, product information right at your fingertips on the ultimate cowboy friendly platform. Want to follow up to date markets? We got you all covered. Ranchchannel.com. No need to dig for information on all those different websites. It's all right there on Ranchchannel.com. Y'all are loving it now aren't you so what has been like the industry's response to butcher solutions llc because you're still a young company yes. right how long how many years have you been doing this a year and a half so yeah, yeah I so you're still very young uh-huh i graduated uh, grad school december of 2022 and 10 days later the business was started um which I, I I was very grateful. I took an entrepreneurship class in grad school because I knew it's like, when I get out, this thing is going to be my job. So it needs to work. Um, and so, it, I mean, it was, it was up and running fast. And even when I was in that entrepreneurship class, I kind of wanted to do a feasibility study. And I called a lot of butchers and I called livestock producers. Most of them I had never met before because I wanted to know that people weren't just blowing smoke, that they really liked the idea and they thought it would work. And so, um, I, I kind of had some some folks in mind that I knew that they, you know, butchers had said, this is something that we actually, we really need in the industry. And yes, we would hire somebody to come in and do a traveling butcher school. Or yes, I'm a livestock producer who had received a grant to open a meat processing facility. And yes, it will be, you know, it'll be brick and mortar in a year from now, but we don't have butchers hired yet and we're going to need somebody to train them. And so it was kind of great timing because when I was planning the business, I, I knew of you know several people who had gotten grants and were building facilities and were going to need training. So I knew it's like, you know, the jobs might not be, you know, lined up immediately, but these people, they're going to need somebody to train their butchers. And so in the year and a half that Butcher Solutions has, has existed, um, I've been able, I've traveled to Texas, I've traveled to Kentucky, I've been in Arizona, plenty in Montana, um, Washington, really all over the country already in a year and a half with just me, my brain and my knives, training butchers with the facility that they're working in with however many butchers they have. And that's really important because these folks, whether it's one or two people in a backyard that want to learn how to slaughter their own beef, or if it's a large you know, meat company in Kentucky that wants to eventually kill a hundred a day, they have 22 butchers working there and none of them have ever held a knife. How do we, how do we get to the grand opening this Friday? And we just start from square one and we start working our way up and training butchers. And um, it's really important that these butchers, they don't have to pay to go somewhere else. And then when they get back home, how do I make that work in our own built butcher shop? I now have carcasses that were hanging here that didn't get cut. And so if it's just me that's traveling, we can train more butchers they know how to make their own facilities work for them, whether that's an older, outdated facility. How do you make it work so that then we can create innovative cuts or we can go faster or we've got a brand new facility. And, and how do we make these rail systems work? And oops, this carcass got stuck here in this room or we've got um, a bandsaw that needs to be moved to make the flow work better. Um, and these folks, they can work on their own carcasses. And so. Yes, you're paying me to come in and train your butchers, but you're also turning out your own products. And so there's no loss of production time, which is really important while we're training butchers. So how long are you are your schools or do they vary depending on like if you're teaching one to three people versus 15 plus? Like, can you talk about what school looks like as far as yeah. length? And I definitely try to cater it towards the skill level of, of the butchers that we're training. So for example, there was a group down in Texas who had a very skilled group of butchers. Um, and they were just simply interested in getting faster because they were having a bottleneck between their, their harvest floor was ripping and roaring and going great. And then they were just kind of hit a, a, a bottleneck from their fab floor. And so can we go faster? Maybe can we try a couple different cutting methods and can we get some new innovative cuts along the way? So I was with them for three days. And by the end of that, I mean, they were rocking and rolling, which was great. 
versus a group I was just with in April um, was again over in Kentucky and they had 22 butchers and all of those folks had never worked in the butchery industry before. One person had cut meat before and they had a year of experience which the rest of them came from a Toyota manufacturing facility or a Nestle plant. They had never even held a knife before. And so I ended up being with them for two weeks straight and then ended up going back a couple more times where I, you know, I'd be there with them for a week and then I take some time off and say, okay, when I come back, let's see what you remember. And then I come back and then it's like, okay, you guys really remember this. You grasp that let's work on now cutting your flat irons or maybe let's break your rounds in a different way. And so by, by working with them for a couple weeks straight and then taking a step away, they could really take that ownership and figure out, you know, where, where they were having, having some troubles and, and where they, were really awesome. You know, I can go and work in a place for a month straight if it is a brand new green crew, which is similar to what I did with a group here in Montana, um, where I worked with them every day for, for two weeks straight, and then was kind of just there watching and observing for the next month or so. Um, which is also different from if folks just want a cutting demonstration for, uh, you know, a cattle grower meeting or a farm bureau meeting just to either excite community members or to do a hunter education class. Those can be very simple one afternoon demo that could be an hour long demo. So depending on what the goal of, of the, the class wants to be, if that's let's get some people excited about meat science or let's train a brand new group of butchers where this will be their job. It might be an hour, it might be two months. So we can, we can cater that curriculum to really fit whatever the need is for that meat science education. So then do you incorporate like food safety into that as well? Because that is, I mean, that's a component anytime we are handling food, but that's also a component that comes to mind, or at least I kind of think about when you look at people who have built facilities at home or maybe facilitating some of that at home. Definitely. And being, being a safe butcher is really important to me and making sure that, you know, whether you're working in an inspected facility or a custom exempt food safety needs to be at the front of these butchers minds, because not only does the livestock producer expect that when their animals dropped off, that it's going to be handled with animal welfare in mind, but also that that animal is going to be aged correctly. And that that the food safety piece is really there and that those products are stored correctly and that the butchers are being safe themselves and that they're handling that meat with a lot of care. And so I am really a stickler about if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. Um, and so yes, safety as a butcher, food safety, um, Perhaps I am not the person to train specifically on HACCP classes um, and that hazard analysis, critical control point, writing a HACCP plan, but I can get people in touch with the people who can write a HACCP plan. And um, I think that's something where I have to remind other folks that, again, it's not a mobile butcher unit and I'm not really a consultant because we think of consultants and it's like many, many years of experience and a long time in the industry. Um, but as, as a person who is pretty ingrained within the meat science um, academic world. I know a lot of people who have specializations within food safety or within slaughter or processed meats. And so even if I don't have the skill that they need, I can help get them in touch with the person that they need. And so I'm, I'm really here to be that meat science advisor as well to, to get the right person for the right job. Um, as much as I want to be the one that's cutting the meat every single time, if there is a specialization that you need, I can help you get connected as well. So as you've done all of these workshops, training schools over the past year and a half, and even your experience before that, mm -hmm. is there any, like, are there any, like, top mistakes you see people make when it comes to maybe breaking down carcasses or cuts or handling carcasses that you want to talk about and shed some light on quick? Sure. And I wouldn't even say that they're mistakes, but the fact that especially, especially in beef carcasses, there are so many different ways that we can break beef. And if we just go to a restaurant or we go to a butcher case and we look at the variety of names for butcher cuts, 
we call beef cuts different things all the time. And so it gets confusing. It's confusing to our customer. It's confusing to the butcher to know what we're going to call something and, and what that aligns with. Um, it's confusing to our livestock producers. They're like, I'm the one raising these cattle and I don't know where the the Merlot state comes from or the Terrace major, what is that? And so for me, my, my master's research was on innovative cuts of the sirloin, which it's like, how much more can we do with the sirloin? Um, but if we think about running just big cuts across the bandsaw, which is what we do sometimes in these smaller facilities, they're really fast cuts. It's the best, you know, the quickest way to get a lot of beef out the door versus let's take our time. And rather than making a large sirloin that's ran across the bandsaw, let's cut out that baseball sirloin and let's take out the culotte and the sirloin tender, which is a cut of steak that my master's research really you know, discovered and delved into. So there are innovative cuts all over these beef carcasses. And if we can show butchers where these in innovative cuts are at and when to use a bandsaw versus when to bone something out so that we don't accidentally cut the flat iron in half, um, so that we are cutting these um, beef cuts correctly um, in the way that the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and the way that their research, when they funded those research projects, intended those meat cuts to look like, um, that's what's really challenging for a, a new butcher to go through and Google and just learn how to cut those, those meats correctly um, and learn like, okay, what is the mock tender versus what is the chuck tender and how are those different and how does one uh, become really tender and I can charge a lot of money for it versus the other one is really trash and should be stew meat or grind. Mm -hmm. And so just helping butchers learn the difference between these cuts, how to make them correctly, and then if they can make more money off those cuts, that adds value back to the livestock producer. And it takes away confusion from our customer at the counter. And so helping people cut innovative cuts, um, and it's it's not really a mistake, it's just the most confusing part about beef. <laughs> and so that's where I really love training butchers on those unique innovative cuts. Well, and like you spoke on at the beginning and hit on several times during this conversation, it all goes back to communicating with the consumer too, because even myself growing up in beef my whole life, and I loved meats judging through high school and all of that, even when we take a beef in and I'm visiting with our local shop and trying to figure out, okay, how do I want to cut this half or, you know, what cuts do we want? It can be overwhelming because there are so many options. So everyone in the process has to understand yep. how diverse or how complex it can be. Yep. And every single cut has a consequence, right? Because all of our consumers, they want that whole beef animal to be ribeyes and tenderloins. And at the end of the day, those ribeyes and tenderloins only make up about 8% of the beef carcass. And so how do we use the other 20 or, you know, uh, mm -hmm. You know, the other percentage of that carcass because 20% in the chuck and 20% in the round. It's like not a lot of really tender steaks come out of the chuck in the round if you're cutting them on the bandsaw. But if you bone them out, we can actually get the flat iron steak in the Delmonico's. And so working with butchers to show them how, how do we cut down on how much grind and how many roasts that we have? Because for all those livestock producers that are trying to manage a branded meats program or are trying to sell more freezer beef or just trying to sell more carcasses, the more grillable items that we can get off of our beef carcasses, the more beef that we're going to sell. And the more exciting we can make them, the better. Absolutely. Because I know it's, you get tired of having hamburgers all the time <laughs> or a hot mm -hmm. dish or some people call it casserole, I guess, skillet yeah. meal, whatever region you're from. I mean, we kind of, we're creatures of habit. We cook a lot of the same things, but that's a way to get you excited about it. If you have kind of new or those grillable cuts, it's a way to get your customers or even other consumers, even if your cattle end up to be beef in grocery stores, it's just a way to build a lot of excitement around beef right. when we help express the diversity we can have with mm -hmm. cooking it. Yep. And going back to that question you'd asked earlier about, you know, what has the response been from, from the beef industry and from cattle producers and, you know, coming into this business, I was, I, I had to keep reminding myself, 
My role as a butcher educator is not to go into the small mom and pop shops that have been working at their shops for years and years and years because they have a customer base that recognizes their products. They are cutting in a way that makes sense to those consumers. And those guys and gals, they are great. They are fine. They are rocking and rolling. They are making their business work. What I'm here for are for the shops that are just getting started or the shops that had a change in leadership or perhaps somebody passed away and now uh, a son or a daughter or a, a coworker is trying to take it over and they want to try a new cut or, man, maybe we do need to go faster. Um, a facility in my hometown, it burnt down and then they were trying to rebuild it and the employees were taking it upon themselves to try to to try to try build it back from the ground up and, and make it different or make it better and better serve that community. And so making sure that Butcher Solutions is here for the people that really do, you know, want to find a new way to market those meat products in their community. And we, we we want our customers to recognize their beef products. And so if you are a shop that's been in existence for years and years and your customer knows what they're getting and you are a really consistent butcher, Butcher Solutions isn't for you. You guys are doing great, keep it going. Um, you know, I'm here for the folks that that have those questions and, and want to find a new way to again, be a better butcher because that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a better butcher so I could train other people along the way too. All right, Sierra, as we kind of wrap up our conversation, where can people find you at? Is it social media? Is it a website? Where do you want people to go to uh, look for butcher solutions? Sure thing. And they can find me on both. So on the website, butchersolutionsllc.com, you'll find my email, you'll find my phone number. Um, give me a call. I would love to to chat with you as a livestock producer. Maybe you know a butcher in your area that um, you, you might like to collaborate with, or um, maybe you've you received a grant yourself and you're like, man, like I did build a processing plant to harvest our own cattle. Or um, maybe you have a local meeting coming up and you'd love a cutting demonstration and we can, you know, we can, we can talk about what your needs are. Um, maybe an FFA or 4-H team that you want to get excited about meat judging. Um, any aspect of, of the meat science world when it comes to beef, pork, lamb, butchery, I'm here for you. So Butcher Solutions LLC.com. You can get a hold of me there. Um, you can also find me on Instagram. Um, it's just Butcher Solutions as well. And I must say, I'm working on, on having a robust social media account, but it's hard to be posting pictures and taking videos when your hands are in the meat. So I am doing my best and we are trying to keep everybody updated on all the places that we're traveling um, as, as much as we can. Um, and by we, I mean me. And so if there are other people that are interested in partnering with Butcher Solutions, that's kind of the next step of the business is that I'd love to have regional butchers all over the country. Um, so then we can, again, we can meet butchers where they're at. So if you are loving this idea and you want to come and hang out on some jobs and maybe learn how to be a butcher educator, you can get a hold of me as well and love to have you Love to have you come along and, and train up some more meat scientists. All righty. Well, Sierra, thank you. And for all of you out there listening, uh, you heard Sierra share her website. I will put that in the show notes as well. Have a great day and happy ranching, folks.